to jump into today's passage. We're in week five of a series on the book of Ephesians, which is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And last week we looked at Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, which Paul starts with the negative and then the positive. He says, you were dead in your sins and trespasses and kind of goes on to all these different things. And he says, but God, and he goes to the positive. So starts with the negative, goes to the positive. This week we're going to see the exact same pattern that he Starts with the negative, he says, but you were this, and then he goes to the positive, but in Christ you are this. And it's really a beautiful passage that's fleshing out. Last week was our personal salvation. This week is actually exactly what we just talked about. It's what God has done in joining us to his people. So last week was about what he has done in joining us to his son and our personal relationship with God. And this week it's about what he's done in joining us to his people and our relationship with with one another. It's a beautiful, rich passage. I'll tell you this, I'm not going to be able to do it justice in 30 minutes. And some of y'all were just like, oh, sweet, 30 minutes. It sounds nice. Okay, so <laughs> I just want you to know, like, this is one of the most robust, rich books in the entire Bible. Some, some people say it's the most condensed version of the gospel that you're going to find in all the scriptures. And so I would encourage you on your own time, be reading, be studying, be praying over Ephesians that God would reveal to you the mysteries and the wisdom and the glory and the beauty that is found in this book, in this letter to the church in Ephesus. With that being said, will you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, you can listen as I read. Therefore, remember that at that time, You Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father, I thank you for this passage, and I thank you for the opportunity to preach it. I ask you to speak your words into our hearts. God, I ask you to open the eyes of our hearts that we might see and behold Christ. And God, I pray, would you write your word on our hearts? Would we see Jesus, and would we see the beauty and the glory of the church this morning? Would we see that this is your body and your bride that you gave your life for? And God, I pray, would we see her as precious as you see her? And would we see the privilege and the honor that it is to be associated with and counted with your people, that we're a people of your presence, a a holy temple, a, a priesthood, that we're citizens with the saints. God, I pray would you open the eyes of our hearts and open our minds to understand and behold and lay hold of these realities in Christ and in our life. I pray as we walk out here today that something about us would be different because of the work of your word in our hearts and our lives. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So as I said, it's the same structure as the previous passage. Matter of fact, Paul begins with the negative, verses 11 through 12, and then he goes to the positive, verses 13 to 22. And he goes for the before, who you were before Christ. He goes with the past tense, which is beyond you. It's past you. It's before where you're at now. He says, this is who you were. Turn to your neighbor and say, you were. And then he goes to the present tense. He says, this is who you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are. are. If you want to get real crazy with it, say, you is. 
To fully understand who you are, you first must remember who you were. And anytime you see a therefore in the scriptures, you should go back and figure out what it's there for. Okay, so, so therefore, verse 12 is connected to, or verse 11 is connected to verses 1 through 10 that we looked at last week. So I want to start point number one with who we were before Christ. If you're taking notes, write that down. That's your main header, and there's going to be some subheaders, who we were before Christ. He says we're Gentiles. That simply means that we're not Jews, that we're not in the promise of God. We're not with God's people, the Jewish people. And he says that we're the uncircumcision, not like the circumcision. This is something man does that God initiated. It's an external action to confirm an internal reality of faith. And so Jewish boys, eight, eight days old, would be circumcised. Okay, I actually interviewed a Jewish rabbi a few years ago when my son was being born, kind of asking him about circumcision and how he does it. And I said, you know, when an adult male converts to Judaism, what do you do if he's already circumcised? And he said, we still have to draw blood. Some of y'all thought our membership process was hard. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we ain't doing that, okay? So a Gentile is simply a non-Jew. Reality check, we're all Gentiles, okay? So he's talking about us. We're separated from Christ. That's point number one. If you've ever done a long-distance relationship, you know how challenging it is to do a relationship across a long distance. Well, God is in heaven, and we're on the earth, and there's a wall between us, which is the wall of our sin, and we have been eternally separated from him. Some people do it like the Grand Canyon, you know, a great chasm. Like, you're on this side, God's on that side, and there's nothing that can get you across. It's literally eternal death to eternal life, and you cannot bridge the gap. That's what it means to be separated from Christ. But it's not just a locational distance. It's a spiritual different di distance. It, think about a divorce. When you've been cut off, like a nasty divorce. I'm not talking like we still love each other. I'm talking like a nasty divorce. The relationship's cut off. There's anger. There's hatred. There's animosity. Uh, th think about when, you know, the border wars, the horrific thing happened where, where children were taken from their parents. Okay, so there's this relational, there's this spiritual, there's this locational distance. We've been separated from Christ. That's the picture of everyone who's not in this covenant of promise. And Paul says, that was you. You weren't in. Friends, we weren't in. We've been separated from Christ. We've been alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Everyone knows what that means, right? I'll just move on, okay? So, no. <laughs> oh, man, I remember the first time I was a new Christian reading this. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The heck does that mean? Okay, so alienation is isolation and estrangement. You've been exiled from your home country and your family. It's what a prisoner in a maximum security prison who's in the box. Can't talk to anybody, can't see the light of day, can't experience any of the goodness of God except for the breath in their lungs. It, it, that's the picture of being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You've been cut off from God's people. All of the blessings, all of the goodness, all of the light. And here's the thing. We're experiencing something today called God's common grace. God's common grace, which means the righteous and the unrighteous, the rain still falls on them. And you've got to understand, in ancient times, rain is a very good thing. You can't have crops without rain. You can't have water without rain. Like, you die without rain. The rain still falls on them. The sun still shines. There's still the covering of trees to protect you from the heat of the sun. Like, there's this common grace that every person receives. Well, in eternity future, when Christ returns, there will no longer be common grace. We will be cut off, if you're not in Christ, from every good and perfect gift from Father above. We were cut off. That's the state of where we were. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. God has made promises to his people for all history. He promised to send a Messiah or a Savior who would pay for our sins with his life, who would die on a cross, who would rise from the dead, who would lead his people forward in flourishing and life and victory. God promised a Messiah. He promised to redeem his broken world, to undo all that Satan did in sickness and death and evil and injustice. God promised, I'll undo all that. He promised not only to, to pay the price with the Messiah, he not only promised redemption, he promised restoration. That one day we, God would be with his people and we would be with him and all would be well in the world. It's called shalom. It's perfect peace with God and man and mankind with one another. 
But our state was we were strangers to that covenant. We knew nothing of that promise. We had no, no ounce of part. We couldn't partake one little bit of that promise of God with his people. You tracking with me? This was a negative, horrific, dark, deadly state that we were in. Uh, imagine when you're scrolling Instagram and you're seeing everyone else's highlight reel. The incredible marriage and the loving spouse and the husband that just dotes on his wife and the kids that seem to be happy and obey. <laughs> what miracle is this that I'm beholding? You know, it's, <laughs> when you're scrolling and you see the nice car and the nice house, the vacation you want, and you just want in on it, but it seems like you can't get in on it because your life is so different. Well, first of all, reality check, it's their highlight reel, not their real life. I wish they'd post some pictures of all the other junk when they were fighting and yelling, you better smile for this picture. You know, like, it's the highlight reel. <laughs> they were talking about divorce before they took the family picture, so everyone would think it's okay, but really behind the scenes, it's a mess. Some of y'all are there right now, and I want you to know we love you. There's no judgment, but God wants to help you. You can't get help unless you get in community. That's why we do small groups, because you need to get people around you to step into your moment and help you. If you don't take off the mask and get real, you're just going to continue to destroy and unwind all the good things God's trying to do in your life, but if you get real with people and confess your sins, as James 5 says, and get help with your situation, God could step in and redeem that thing, and he'll do the thing you thought could never happen in your life. Yeah. And, and that wasn't in the notes. I just feel that for some people in the room. You got to get in community. You got to get the mask off. You got to get real with some people. And if you don't, it's just going to keep going south. But God wants, he wants to step in and do the thing you couldn't do. He wants to make mercy out of that mess. Okay? We were strangers to the covenants of promise. To summarize, we were cut off from God and his people. That's the bad news. Or as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, we had no hope and we were without God in the world. Just think about that for a second. No hope without God in the world. You know how crazy this world is? No hope without God in this world. That was our state. For some of you, that's still your condition because you've not called on Christ. And the moment you call on Christ, God changes your condition from that to what I'm getting ready to tell you. Into this bleak, dark picture, very similar words are spoken as to what was spoken in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Now it comes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Verse 4 says, but God... The best two words in the entire scripture, but God. You were dead in your sins, your trespasses and sins. You were, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were cut off from Christ, all these things, but God, but God, but God and his love for you because of his mercy towards you. Ephesians just goes on and on, but then Ephesians 2.13 does the same thing. It says, but now, this is the best four words in all of scripture, okay? So we got the best two words and then the best four words, all right? So, but now, it's five words. Wow, Dylan, come on. Some of y'all are nice, and you're just like, he missed it. Okay, so I don't count the in. It's just a supplement, you know, whatever. But now in Christ Jesus. So but God, but now in Christ Jesus, and then he begins to tell us what Christ has accomplished for us. Let's point to what Christ has accomplished for us. Number one, he's brought us near by his blood. We were far off. We were cut off, and he's brought us near by his blood. This alone should cause you to rejoice. This alone should cause you, as Keith said earlier, to shout hallelujah, hallelujah. I've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, but now, Ephesians 2.13, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's like those kids separated at the border. It's like someone paid the price for that child to be reconnected with their father and then they brought the child to the father. If you could just imagine the moment where the daughter looks up and sees her daddy. As somebody's paid the price for that little girl to be reunited with her father and her mother and her siblings. And the daughter looks up and sees her daddy. And the daddy looks up and sees his daughter. And the daughter runs into his arms. They embrace. It's that moment. It's a picture. Or, or like the slaves that were purchased out of slavery in Nepal and given their freedom. This generational slavery. It's that picture of the sons and daughters being reunited with the fathers and mothers. It's that picture that, that Christ had in his mind when he said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. 
What do you mean the joy set before him? The joy of the children of God being reunited with Father God. That we might have perfect relationship and unity and communion. We might sit at his table and be in his presence, in his house. That he would come and make his dwelling among us forever and ever. Like, this is remarkable. This is emotional. Some people who say, oh man, worship in church, so, you know, it's just emotionalism these days. Would you feel emotional if that was your kid? Did you get emotional when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl? Um, Did you get emotional on your wedding day? And some of y'all, I get it, you don't cry, you know, but you're crying on the inside. I, I know you, I see you, okay, so you're still emotional. How much more when we've been brought near by the blood, the, the blood of Jesus Christ? What does that mean? It's not like blood in a cup. It's not our little communion cups. That, this is a man on a cross, the Son of God, from eternity past to eternity future, seated with the Father in heaven, all the angels singing his praise, all the angels gather around, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I mean, just all the praise, all the glory, all the goodness, all the love of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Perfect community, perfect unity, perfect love for all eternity. And he left all of that to come and put on flesh and dwell among us. And dwell amongst the stench of our sin and the stench of our brokenness and the stench of this world that's been corrupted and polluted by sin. He came to dwell among that. And then he paid for us on the cross with his blood. And you think the physical cross was bad. The nails in his hands, the nails in his feet, the hanging and suffocating and bleeding, the crown of thorns twisted and pressed upon his head, the whippings and the beatings and the lashings. You think that was bad. That wasn't nothing. For the father to pour out his wrath on his son. For the father to pour out all of his judgment on his son, whom he has loved from eternity past to eternity future for all time, something we can never get our little heads around. For the father to pour all that out on the son, for his love for us. When we say we've been brought near by the blood of Christ, oh, friends, it is a glorious glorious thing. Why do we take communion every Sunday? Why every Sunday do we take this little cup with a little cracker that's stale? And one, as one student in our student ministry told me, he said, Dylan, that cracker is old. <laughs> I was like, well, order some more. Okay, so why do we do that? We do that because it reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ on the cross, the nails in his hands, the crown on his head, The blood that was spilled for us when they stuck that spear in his side and he bled out. They said, yeah, there's water and blood. It's separated. The man's dead. That's how they knew when they stuck that spear in his side. And it's that we remind ourselves and we remind ourselves of the wrath of God poured on him that should have been poured on us. And we declare, Paul tells us, we declare his death until he returns every time we take it. I was talking with Chad earlier this week, and he's doing this study on church history and all this different stuff. And he was saying, you know, it's fascinating how at some point in church history, the church decided to take it once a month instead of once a week because it had just become ritual. And he was, he was commenting on the fact that it had just become ritual, but yet we sing these songs, we preach these messages. It became ritual because it became ritual in our heart, not because it just became, it's, it's never just, it's a massive, significant thing when we take communion. Jesus said, every time you gather, do this in my name. I'd encourage you around your dinner table with your kids, take communion. In your small group, take communion. On a Sunday, we're going to take communion. We're reminding ourselves of this gospel. That's point one of like six under point two. Y'all ready for church today? Okay, so (laughs) he broke down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. Again, this is the cross. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This this wall that stood between us and God, this division that stood between one another, Christ has torn it down by tearing apart his flesh. When we wanted to say to one another, I hate you, I want to kill you, I'm done with you, when we refuse to forgive, when we get angry in our hearts, when we live under a spirit of bitterness, when When we want to be mad at the world and at God, Jesus says, don't kill each other. 
kill me. How great a love with which he has loved us. He broke down in the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He created one new man in himself in place of the two. So you had Gentile and Jew, massive categories of all people for all time throughout all human history, Gentile and Jew, until Christ came. Uh, I'll read it to you and then I'll talk to you about it. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, this is the law of Moses, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Okay, commandments and ordinances, that's, that's meat, that's prayers, that's food, that's calendars, it's new moons. It's all the laws, the 613 Jewish laws, and the traditions of men that were stacked on top of that. Paul's writing and saying he tore all that apart. Actually, he fulfilled it in himself, and, and he tore down the dividing wall, saying you couldn't get in and you could get in. Matter of fact, if we have that picture of the temple, can we show that? Okay, so this is a blurry picture. My apologies, but um, this is the Gentile. Where are we at? Okay, this is the inside of the temple. So over here and over here, there's this big open space. This is the Gentile court. Matter of fact, there was an inscription written right here and right here on the entrances that says, the man who enters this court, the, the court of the Jews on the inside here, the man who enters that, he's, he's responsible for his own death. That's how great a separation there was. And then you had the, the uh, court of the priests, and then you had the holy of holies. And that's where the great high priest went once a year to make a sacrifice for all the people for all their sins. And that the blood of an animal would take and cover the blood of the people, just like Jesus went once and for all to the throne of God and died in our place for our sins, that his blood might take our sins away for all time. And so there could not have been a greater division. There were two, you can remove that, thank you. There were two groups of people. Um, we're really good at making division. God's really good at making unity. Um, what's our version of that? We've got this worship style and this worship style, this church style and this church style, this preaching style and this preaching, and this is bad and this is good, and this is bad and this is good, and this is bad. We are so good at making, now there's things God has revealed in his word that we should do, right? Like we should worship him in spirit and in truth. It shouldn't just be emotionalism. And it shouldn't just be dry truth. Mm, yes, let's say the Lord, yes. Actually, the Bible says clap. The Bible says raise your hands. The Bible says shout for joy. That's why I shout a lot. I'm just obeying the scriptures, okay? So, the, uh, we divide, we divide, we divide. You know what? There's enough critics of the church today. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about the church. Can we be those who speak life over her and bless her and encourage her and pray for her and give our lives to see her built up and his kingdom advance that his glory might be renowned in the earth? We create division. God creates unity. We create chaos. God creates peace. If I were to divide out the room and say, feel nervous. If I were to say all the Democrats over here, all the Republicans over here, uh, based on your race and ethnicity, if you could just go to different parts of the room, that'd be great. Um, those who homeschool, private school, public school, go to different parts of the room. Um, if you're a Chiefs fan, just go ahead and get up on stage, but everybody else just... <laughs> uh, I had to. Um, any prejudice, any racism, any elitism, I'm better than you, in your heart or my heart is an offense to God. He has made us one. So anything we would do to compromise or jeopardize or, or, or treat one another like we're not one in Christ is an offense to him. I know very racist white people, usually stemming from family of origin and lies they've been told, and fear that has been embedded into their soul for generations. I also know very racist black people and Hispanic people uh, who for the same, different reasons, but in a similar way, things have been embedded into them to view people a certain way. Uh, like my friend in St. Louis, who when he was in high school, was driving home in his own city and the police pulled him over, and I love police officers. The police pulled him over and opened, told him to get out of his car, said he, they were looking for drugs, and he had just gotten a brand new car, panels put on the inside of his car. He was really excited about them. And they ripped the panels off and destroyed his car for no reason in his own city as he's driving home. 
And I could tell you story after story after story. So a couple of years ago, you know, you've got all these things hitting the news, George Floyd, all this different stuff. And people start saying, black lives matter. And a lot of people start saying, that's terrible. All lives matter. And there's this huge debate and this huge fight. Um, just to say, the organization Black Lives Matter doesn't stand for Jesus or kingdom or Christianity, so I can't get behind that organization. But the statement, all this division, all this hatred, all this anger, similar people who are saying babies' lives matter. As Christians, from the womb to the tomb, all lives matter, yes. But sometimes when there's an injustice done against a certain group of people, it's important to say, hey, check it out, y'all. Their life matters. And some of you just went, oh my gosh, this is a liberal church and he's gone woke. <laughs> Run! Get the kids out! This house is on fire! That's not true. I believe things that offend Democrats and Republicans, so everyone gets to hate me, okay? So, <laughs> because, because I believe the Bible. And actually, as a Christian, you should too. You should too. And do it in love with grace and truth. But can I just say, like, we have to acknowledge the pain in the room. Can I acknowledge the fact that Hispanics have been left out of the conversation? That, that Spanish speakers are looking at the black-white conflict saying, what about us? There's been a lot done to us. And there's, there's white people who are raised in, in poverty, in crime, in, in broken homes that are saying, man, I know you're saying I'm privileged and I get it. There's some ways I am, but there's other ways like my life's a mess and I need God. We all are sinners in need of a Savior. Can I get an amen on that, church? Okay. We're on the same page with that. Okay. So to really build this one new man, this beautiful thing that Jesus has bought with his blood, we have to lean in to listen to each other. We have to lean in to understand. I was ignorant of it until I was about 22 years old, and I was pastoring a church. There's a bunch of black people in my church, and a kid got murdered, Michael Brown in St. Louis, and I'm pastoring a church in St. Louis. And I started to ask, hey, tell me about your life. And I heard things, and I was like, how is that possible that you've experienced that, and I've never even heard of this stuff? I was ignorant to it. The only way we're going to learn and grow and experience unity is if we lean into each other. And can I just encourage you, don't be the one who waits for someone else to lean in, but go lean in yourself. And if you're like, well, man, I've experienced a lot of injustice and a lot of pain, and please run to the Lord and get healing, and please run into this community, and I pray this community is a place of healing and understanding for you, but also please run and try and understand the other first. Because if we seek to be understood before we seek to understand, none of us are getting anywhere. But if we do like Jesus and we, we listen more than we speak, we're quick to listen, slow to speak. If we do that, and by God's grace, something beautiful can happen in this house. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 I just need it to help me. Thank you for that. I want to say if you're an interracial couple, there's some people who would say that's bad. In this house, we say that's beautiful. That's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It's the coming together of people from different cultures and ethnicities and races and, and seeing this unit. It's a little picture. It's a mini picture of what Christ is trying to build in his church. Where in Revelation it says every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation gathered around that throne singing praises to God. It's a beautiful thing. Ephesians 4, 20, Ephesians 4, 2 to 3 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, we're bearing with one another in love. This is what our community is meant to look like. We're eager to maintain. Turn to your neighbor and say, maintain it. Maintain, maintain it. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Notice he didn't say create it. He didn't say you got to create unity. No, Jesus did that on the cross with his blood. Yeah. He, he's called us to maintain unity. So we recognize he's already paid for it. I have a friend, his wife, uh, you know, he's pastoring a church in Joplin for 40 years. And his wife, uh, amazing woman of God, brilliant mind. And, and uh, they've got a whole bunch of kids. I don't even know how many kids, six or seven. <laughs> they've got a bunch of kids. Uh, more than I can count and more than I'll ever have, okay? Just put it out there. So, um, and her kids were fighting one day. They were arguing. And she stopped them. And she got firm. Like the husband was like, oh, no. And, uh, and she said, don't you dare disrupt the peace that Jesus Christ bought with his blood over this house. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Rebecca, you should use that on our kids one day. Okay, so... <laughs> like, you don't cross mama. Okay, so 
Our job is to maintain something he already paid for. Another point, he's reconciled us to God. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He's reconciled us to God. He's, he's reconnected our relationship. He's restored right relationship with God and man. He's paid the price for us to be with him and with one another. He preached peace to all people. He came and he preached peace to you who are far off. That's the Gentile. And to those who are near. That's the Jew. This peace, it's God's perfect relationship with God and man. It's God being reunited with his people. In summary, Christ has created one new man in himself. And then he goes on, he says, now we are members of God's growing family. If you want to point number three, so who we were before Christ, what Christ has accomplished, and now who we are. We are members of God's growing family. This is who we are in Christ. A couple things I want to point out to you, and then we're going to receive communion together. He says, Verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You were that, but you're not that. You are fellow citizens, underline that, citizens, with the saints, underline that, saints, and members, did membership recognition this morning, but this is membership in God's house, the big C church, and members of the household of God. So your citizens, your saints, and your members, this is who you are. You're citizens, not of this earth anymore. Your primary citizenship is not on earth. It's in heaven. I'm going to Nepal later this year. Got to have a passport for it. I'm going to be in Nepal, visiting Nepal, not speaking Nepali because your brother can't figure that out, but hanging out with Nepali people, eating Nepali food. I'm going to be there, but I'm not a citizen there. My citizenship is here. In the same way, God says, I've sent you into the world, but you're not of the world. You're not a citizen of this world. You're a citizen of heaven. We talked about that in Ephesians chapter 1. That we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's where we are. That's where our citizenship is. Yet we're visiting here short term so that we might preach his gospel and fill the earth with his glory. We're citizens. We're saints. We're holy. We're set apart. We're called by God. Some of you are raised to say saints are really special people. No, no, the Bible says saints are every person who's called on the name of Jesus. This isn't about the accomplishment of your works. This is about your identity in Christ. It's what he's done, not what you do, that makes you a saint. We're members of God's household or God's family. This comes from his paternity as our father. And it's beautiful, glorious, and good. God is your daddy, he's your papa, he's your Abba, Abba, Father, Daddy. That's who he is for you. He provides for you, he protects you, he brings his presence into your life. One day he will come down and say that his home is with you and you with him. When the heavens comes down upon the earth and there's a new heaven and a new earth, You'll be with him for all eternity. He is working night and day to make that happen. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Um, built a deck at my last house. I learned on the first deck at my house before that that there's two things you have to get really right. You have to get the footings right in the right place. You have to get the deck framing square. If the framing's not square, everything else is a nightmare. If the framing is perfectly square, everything else is easy. Okay, I've never built a stone structure, but this Jesus as the cornerstone, they're referring to the architecture of the day, and they're saying this, this cornerstone, I'm told, every other stone is built around it, just like the framing on my deck. Every other stone is built around it. And the size and the shape and where it's positioned, that cornerstone sets up the structure for the entire rest of the building. And if that stone is perfect, everything else works. And if the stone's not perfect, nothing else works. Jesus Christ is your cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of the church. He's perfect in every single way. The perfect, sinless son of God, born of a virgin, died in our place for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven. One day he'll return in glory. This is the cornerstone. This is Christ Jesus. He's perfect in every way. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Prophets, Old Testament, apostles, New Testament. Jesus is at the center of it all. And he's building his church through the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And now he's building his people all across the world. Actually, I want to show you this picture. A guy in Growth Track showed this to me last few weeks ago. And I, I love it. The lines, all the crazy lines. So there's 60,000 references to Christ throughout the whole of Scripture. 
In the Old Testament, there's over 300 prophetic promises about the Messiah, the Christ who is to come. So one of the guys who was just on stage earlier sent me this. He said, hey, check this out. Because I was talking about the, this idea and growth track. And he said, man, I saw this and it really impacted me. 60,000 references to Christ throughout the Old and New Testament. It's remarkable. You can move on that. It, verse 21, in whom the whole structure. So people say the church is an organization. It's a family. Actually, it's both. Okay, so it's a structure. It's a body, it's a bride, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the structure, there's organization, there's order, there's leadership, everything has a plan and a purpose. I like to say it this way, Jesus is the architect and the engineer and the general contractor, okay? He's got electricians and plumbers and foremen and leaders and all that stuff, but he's at the head of it all, okay? There's structure, and it's being joined together. We had a brick house in St. Louis and brick upon brick upon brick, but there's mortar between every brick. Jesus is the mortar between every stone. The mortar is just like the concrete filling. Some of you are like, what's mortar? Okay, so it's not glue. It's like concrete, but you pour it in there and then it connects all the bricks, okay? That's who he is. He's uniting us all. He's joining us all. He's the one doing it. He's the center and the source of everything in the church. And it grows. It's not some static structure. It's not fixed in place. It's not like a building. Actually, matter of fact, the church is not a building. If you're hearing like, I'm going to church today, you are because you're gathering with God's people. But when this building's empty, it's no more holy than the building across the street. That's why I'm fine if we meet in a high school, a church building, a tent outside. I don't care, okay? I don't like to sweat, so no tent for me. But all right, like I'm, I'm thankful for the AC, all right? So, but it grows. It's alive. It's organic. It's a body and a bride. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16 tells us how it grows. It says, every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, my job is to equip you, your job is to do the work of ministry. When each part is working properly, playing its part in the body of Christ, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. How does the church grow? We all play our part. That's how it grows. And we're being built into a holy temple. I don't have time for this, but the New Testament temple replaces the Old Testament temple. The Old Testament temple that I showed you where God's people would go to meet with God's presence and have made sacrifice for their sins. The New Testament temple, Jesus said he would tear that temple down and rebuild it in three days. And people said, what? Took our forefathers years to build this. Got all mad and they killed him. Okay, that's what happened. Jesus said, I'm going to tear down that temple and I'm going to rebuild it in myself resurrected three days later. He's the temple, and he's made us into temples. And together we're a temple. What is a temple? It's a place, place where God's presence dwells. So before in that room, that holy of holies, there was a box called the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God's presence was. Well, now there's not a box, there's a person. And God's presence is in you. And when we gather together there, he says, there I am with them when they come together. When my people are together in my name, there I am with them. There's something special about gathering with God's people. That's why the author of Hebrews says, do not neglect gathering together as some have done. Some people said, I'm spending the whole summer at the lake. I don't want to see God's people. I want to see a beach. And God said, don't neglect that. Go to the lake, but then come back and gather with God's people. Because it's so precious and special to be with his people. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have access to God through what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. I'm out of time. I can't get into the rest of it. Will you stand with me to receive communion together? If you're here and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to start a relationship with him today. Uh, it happens through faith in his name in his death, in his resurrection. The Bible says that if you believe that God has raised him from the dead and you confess him as Lord, that you will be saved. Over the last few weeks, we've seen 17 people commit their life to Christ or recommit their life to Christ or say, I want to be baptized in this house. Praise God for that. Amen. Uh, that could be you today. Today could be the day for you to call upon the name of Jesus. Today could be the day for you to say, God, I want you to come and change my life to forgive me of my sins, to make me alive in Christ, to help me walk in relationship with Jesus. And it happens not by anything you do, but by what he has done for us. Because we were dead in our sins and because he's made us alive together with Christ. 
And that can happen for you today if you simply call on his name. It's not about anything you do. I had the privilege of leading one of our youth to Christ the other night, and I explained it to him like this. I said, you know, the, the light switches off in your life. It's darkness. And you want to go around and clean it up and get everything right and settled and organized. But God in his love for you says, don't worry about all that. You don't have to clean the room up first. You don't have to clean your life up first. Just let him in. Turn the light on. Let Christ come in. And when Christ comes in, Christ will clean up the mess. He'll love you. He'll forgive you. He'll change you. Just let him in. Surrender to him. Give it all to him. And he will do more in your life than you could ever imagine. And today just may be that day for some of you. And if it is, it would be the, the honor of my life to help you, to just hold your hand and walk with you as you give your life to Christ. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, pray this prayer. If you're coming back to God today, maybe you've known him, but you've walked away from him. And today is a day where you return or recommit to him. Pray this prayer with us. And if you pray this prayer, just mark it on your card and let us know card on the seat back in front of you because our team would love to help you take your next step and get strong in your faith but the first step the first step is today and it's simply praying this prayer there's no power in the prayer the power is in your the faith in your heart and the surrender of your life to Jesus as Lord close your eyes bow your heads with me let's pray together church every single one of us father thank you for your son Jesus Christ, I believe that he died in my place for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. I confess I am a sinner in need of a savior. Please forgive me and make me new. I surrender all that I am and all that I have to you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen, and amen. Church, put your hands together for anybody who just made that decision. Come on now. Come on, better than a golf clap. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if anybody just prayed that prayer, our team would love to follow up, would love to help you. But right now, we're going to do, we're going to take communion together. If you grab that cup, open it up. It's in the seat in front of every person, that little metal tray in the seat in front of you. It's just a little cup. It's got a cracker on top. I promised it's a stale cracker, okay? It's got that cup beneath. This cracker represents the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross for us. This cup, the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us. And every time we take it, we preach his death until he returns. Church, you may take the bread and eat. You may take the cup and drink. Let's worship our Lord.